our last yeah so our last presentation today uh the speaker is going to be william hill he's a nnl is an expert in high resolution mass spectrometry and nmr applied to complex mixture analysis um, and today he's going to be talking about the metabolomic, metabolomics data processing pipelines. Uh, so we'll take it away. Sure thing. Uh, assuming I'm still working, if I'm not, just yell at me. Uh, looks good. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about metabolomics data processing. This is a big, complicated area. Um, I put together quite a number of slides, and I'll try and get through them on time and on schedule, but some of the material we go over relatively quickly uh, and unfortunately that's just the nature of trying to cover such a diverse topic um, so let's see here we go what i want to do is talk about some general concepts and overall themes and goals and then contextualize them in mass spectrometry coupled to gas chromatography and liquid chromatography like we've learned about this morning and then talk about nuclear magnetic resonance how we go about processing those data sets and then this all leads into some things you'll learn tomorrow about data integration, um, data curation. But some of those things we have to think about during this process as well. So one thing that I want to stress is the, the main goal here is we want to get quality informative data from our instruments and from our samples and then pipe those into models and better understanding. And there's this nice little graphic which always shows, you know, generating data is pretty easy. It's really not that hard to get something out of an instrument, but getting useful information out of an instrument and getting useful information out of data required is actually the challenge. And so we know that there's lots of different ways to do this. There's lots of different data processing pipelines. Uh, but you need to understand which ones are more suited to different applications. And the choices that you make at each stage do matter at every uh, inference that you'll make down the pipeline. And one thing to stress is that your experimental design doesn't stop when you acquire the data. It, you, your experimental design has to factor in data processing, data analysis, and not just how you actually generate the samples up front. So uh, I've stolen this quote from my uncle actually, which is to define is to deliver. And I think it sort of summarizes nicely that if you can actually define what it is you're trying to do well, you will be able to deliver on that task. So you need to define the question. Now this is the scientific question that you're trying to ask about your biological system, but also the question you're trying to ask in the context of the analytical equipment that you have available. And to really do that, you need to understand the techniques. So this morning we've learned about mass spec and NMR, and hopefully we understand a little bit better their strengths and their weaknesses. And then with this, you can start to use the best tools for the job. Um, and really what's key is that you need to incorporate domain knowledge into this workflow. So you need to know your biological system. You need to know the analytical techniques to be able to actually do this whole analytical pipeline. What is the overall goal of this, you know, 40 minutes or so we have to discuss? You know, you want to go from raw input, raw data from the instrument, and you want to get an output table of quantified molecular identifications. It sounds simple, but in reality, it's pretty complicated. There's a number of things that stand in our way. There's proprietary file formats that we have to fight, signal processing considerations, data quality is not always there, the database quality. So when we're comparing to reference data, that may not be sufficient. It may not be complete or cohesive. There's computational limitations associated with a lot of the steps that we take. There's a lot of subjectivity, especially in some of the NMR processing, which can lead to human biases. And there's instrumental biases too, as we've discussed a little bit. And finally, there's time. There's only so much time in the day to do these analyses. So you really wanna be efficient, but accurate. So I'm gonna start off by talking about LC and GCMS. There's a lot of overlap between these techniques. So most of this is gonna focus on LCMS and some of the themes are common to GC. And then this afternoon, the little breakout session will explore some of these a little bit more detail. So as has been alluded to this morning, there's two main workflows. There's targeted and untargeted pipelines. Now in targeted GC or LC metabolomics, we tend to be talking about looking for specific chemicals, specific compounds, and trying to get absolute quantification on those. These pipelines require standards. They require quite a lot of method development to get the highest possible accuracy and precision and reproducibility. And those methods need to be developed for each analyte type, for each sample type. And then you need calibration curves for quantification. So this is quite a uh, prescriptive method. 
But it isn't actually the way that we do most of our metabolomics in EMSL. We instead focus on untargeted uh, analysis, where we're trying to profile a whole complex sample. We want to get data that we can feed into statistical models. We want to identify unknown species. We want to discover relative differences in compound abundances. And one thing to stress is even though I say untargeted, it doesn't mean it's without bias and it doesn't mean it's non-selective. Because we're using a chromatographic separation, because we're coupling it to a specific type of mass analyzer, there are selectivities and biases associated. So the overall goal is to go from a chromatogram, which might look something like this, to an output table of identified features. And there's a number of steps you have to go through in this process, from data collection and peak detection, all the way through to identification and de-isotoping. I will stress that the, the panel on the right there that shows this workflow is just an example workflow. You will find examples where people rearrange those things in slightly different orders, or they may skip steps or add different steps that we don't cover. One thing to sort of reiterate from this morning is that we've got this dimensionality to our data. So when we have a separation, we've got a liquid chromatography domain, so a time domain for our retention time, our chromatogram, and we also have a mass spectrometry domain. So at each time point in our separation, we acquire a mass spectrum that represents all of the features that are there. And so this is a sort of a visualization of LCMS. And from that, we can get this output table where we have a retention time and our mass to charge ratio for our precursor ion. And so this gives us a sort of unique identifier for every feature that we might detect. And then associated with that, we have the intensity or the abundance of that feature in each sample that we're looking at. But when we do LCMSMS, we actually introduce an additional dimension. And this is the fragmentation ion mass spectra. And in this case, what we do is at each time point, we record a mass spectrum. And then in our mass spectra, we look for the most intense features. We isolate those and fragment them. And we get an additional mass spectrum, which shows something like this with a precursor ion and then a series of fragment ions that are detected. So the output of doing an LCMSMS run is that your feature table might include these sorts of columns. And so I'll just quickly run through what these different columns include and how they might come to be before we start really discussing how you analyze the data to get these. So the first up, uh, first column is this identification column. So this might be an identified metabolite, a name, something like glucose, vitamin B12, elagic acid. These are sort of the gold standard identification. You've really put a name to a feature. It's not always possible. Um, and even if you do manage to identify it, there's a confidence level associated with that. Different groups report their confidence in different ways. But it's important to note that if you get to this level, that's really good. Um, and of course, these are also unique identifiers for your future. So those are for your feature. So it's really useful to have this. And we get this through uh, through using our databases and comparing it to our MSMS features as well as our chromatographic separation. One step below that in uh, identification is just the molecular formula. So the number of of atoms, the number of each element that we have in our identity. Now, this is not necessarily a unique feature in our LCMS run because the same molecular formula might be detected multiple times. And of course, we have a sort of confidence associated with this, but we don't measure molecular formula. We actually infer it or calculate it from the measured mass to charge ratio that we get. So there's some confidence or uncertainty associated with this. Additionally, we have this ion type. So as Young Mo alluded to this morning, when you're generating your uh, ions, they form different types of ions, depending if it's positive or negative charge and depending on which ionization source you use. And the two things I wanna highlight here are that sometimes our molecule M is ionized by adducting to a sodium atom or a potassium atom, for example, uh, or oftentimes it's just adding a proton. But additionally, we get our charge indicated uh, with this superscript plus sign here indicating it's plus one charge. And in this case, vitamin B12 is plus two charges. And the key thing there is that when we measure a mass spectrum, we're not measuring mass directly, we're measuring the mass to charge ratio. So if something weighs a thousand Daltons, but it has two charges, it's M over Z will be 500. And that's what we see here with vitamin B12. It weighs about 12, 1300 Daltons, but because it's doubly charged, its mass to charge ratio is about 678. 
a little bit of an interlude about ionization sources. Uh, just to reiterate, in mass spec, we measure ions. We don't measure neutral molecules. And so the ionization source you've used is key. And it's really important to keep that in mind when you're analyzing. Generally, LCMS, we're using electrospray ionization. Soft gives you intact molecular ions. And in GCMS, we use electron ionization, which is hard and gives you these fragmentation ion spectra. Additionally, we've got the retention time. Now, this is the time at which your feature is detected after elution from the chromatographic column. This here uh, should be fairly reproducible, but it might not be, depending on your instrument conditions and what you're comparing it to. Um, and in and of itself, it doesn't tell you a huge amount about the molecule unless you understand the chromatography that you've done. So for example, if you've used a size exclusion column, you might be able to infer if a molecule is bigger or larger, depending on at what point it elutes. Likewise, if you use a reverse phase separation or normal phase separation, you might be able to infer if it's more or less polar, depending on what point it elutes off the column. You can only compare retention times to other separations that use the same chromatography, i.e. the same column, the same solvents, the same conditions, the same sample injection matrix, i.e. an aqueous sample was injected. But this is still useful information. And then we have the mass to charge ratio for the precursor ion, the MS1 information. Now, the accuracy and precision that we associate with this depends on what mass analyzer you used. In the case of an Orbitrap or FTICR, we get really good accuracy and precision. In the case of a linear ion trap, we have much less accuracy and precision. Um, as I said, we can use this to calculate the molecular formula. And we do this just by some sort of combinatorial searching. And the error or the uncertainty that we associate with that is the difference between the measured mass to charge ratio and the theoretical mass to charge ratio of the assigned molecular formula that we determine it to be. And that's typically reported in parts per million units, where something under one ppm is really good and what we would get from FDICR. Something under five ppm is what you might get from Orbitrap, under 20 ppm maybe from a TOF. And so you can see that there's different confidences associated with our features. Again, we might detect the same mass to charge ratio multiple times in our run. And this is because of isomers and isobars, potentially. So again, a little bit of explanation. An isomer is something which is the same molecular formula, but a different structure. You've got spatial isomers or stereoisomers, such as glucose and mannose, which are both hexoses, both have the same molecular formula. And the only difference is that the hydroxy groups in position one and four are up in the case of mannose or down in the case of glucose relative to the anomeric uh, position. These will give very similar mass spectra, very similar fragmentation spectra, but should be separatable on a column depending on what chromatography you use. We also have structural isomers like dimethyl phthalate or ferulic acid. One of these is a plasticizer and one of these is a key component in lignin biosynthetic pathways. And so you can see that they might have completely different importances in our analysis, but they have the same molecular formula. So these are isomers. We also have isobars. And so these are compounds with almost exactly the same mass. So generally speaking, it means something that is the same integer or nominal mass, i.e. 186 M over Z. Here we have two completely different compounds, different structures, different molecular formula, different chemistries, but their mass is only 0.07 M over Z apart. So on a high res instrument, we would resolve these no problem. But on a low resolution instrument, like a linear ion trap, we might not resolve them. And if we want to do MSMS experiments, we need to use LC up front to separate them. So there is always a, a need to use LC in these sort of experiments. And then we get to the fragment ion mass spectra. So these are the mass to charge ratios of all of the detected fragment ions. And again, we have associated accuracies, precisions, and reproducibility, depending on what mass analyzer is being used. Ideally, these represent the fragments of the single isolated precursor, but that depends on how good your LC is and how good your mass spectrometer is at isolating specific ions. Some ions have a lot, uh, some molecules give a lot of fragments and some molecules give very few. Uh, and one more thing to stress is that if the mass to charge ratio of the precursor is greater than one in the case of vitamin B12, you can actually fragment it and produce ions that are singly charged and therefore their mass to charge ratio can end up being larger than for the precursor. 
And then finally, you've got the quantified values. So these are the how much was detected. And so this number is generally arbitrary units. And it represents, in the case of simple LCMS, the ion count, which, you know, an electrical signal, a current that's detected by the analyzer. Or if you had a UV vis absorbance detector in line, it would be the amount of that that is detected. And again, we're integrating a peak area here to give us the intensity value there. As we've stressed a few times, especially in the, in the chats on Discord, this is the relative comparison you can make between the same ion in different samples. So you can compare, in this case, 46, 36, and 85, but you couldn't compare 46 and 93 because those are different compounds, which will ionize differently. And one more thing to stress, you don't want to say you have zero of a compound because it's very hard to prove you don't have a compound. Instead, you would say it's lower than a limit of detection or it's not detected. Um, so let's see, I think we're still okay for time. Uh, the general workflow for LCMS uh, MS data uh, processing goes like this. So we start off having to get our data out of our proprietary vendor format into some open source uh, or open um, structure that we can parse or process our own way. So Proteo Wizard is a super popular tool. We're developing Core MS, which can also handle these file formats natively. And there's some vendor provided tools like Compass Export or Masslinks, which can do these conversions. Then you've got peak detection. And so what we're trying to do here is go and detect all of our chromatographic features. So an ideal chromatogram has a number of sharp features. They're symmetrical, they're baseline resolved. They have smooth curves to them, a nice, well-defined apex, and the overall baseline is flat. In reality, that never happens. And instead, we get this sort of baseline changing over time. We've got a number of sharp features, but you can also see examples where there are features that are not actually separated. And there's two co-alluding features at this point, for example. And sometimes you want to avoid things like tailing, splitting, fronting. And I don't have time to talk about those, but uh, if you do have these issues, they're very difficult to resolve post-processing. And you generally want to go back and improve your upfront separation. We then go on to deconvolution, where we have to accept that in the real world, our peaks are not going to be baseline resolved all the time. And so how do we actually separate out our features? And so this process of deconvolution takes something that might look like this with three peaks approximately and identify and separate out what those three features are in terms of the true area associated with those and their true apexes. It simplifies the downstream analysis quite a lot, but it does make assumptions about what peak shapes you have. And then we go into identification, which is really the most challenging part of this. Um, by and large, we use what's called standards-based identification, where we compare our measured data with reference databases to try and find either the same compound or similar molecules. And with this, we can um, use the retention time and both of our mass spectra domains to um, compared to a database. There are standards free methods, either in silico ones where you generate a database computationally, or if you have a, a completely unknown molecule, you might need to use something like NMR to actually solve a structure in consultation and in consort with uh, prep scale LC separations to isolate pure compounds. So when we do standards-based identification, we build a database or we use an external database, most of the time a hybrid of the two. For retention time, we have to compare it only when the chromatography is matched. So I'm stressing this again, you can't compare between different types of chromatography. You need to be using the same column dimensions, the same sorbent type, the same flow rate, the same solvent compositions, and the same column temperature. And even then, retention times can drift between measurements. With the mass spectra comparisons, your mass to charge values for the precursor should be pretty good to get a formula. And your fragmentation spectra should be fairly reproducible and fairly good at comparing between databases and between runs, with the caveat that you can only compare the same fragmentation type, i.e. whether you used HCD or IRMPD, the same fragmentation energies and durations, i.e. the amount of energy that you put into it to break it up, and also the same ion type. So adduct uh, molecules may fragment differently. So a sodiated molecule may di fragment differently to a protonated form. When we don't have the molecule in the database, for example, it's an unusual sample, or we've got some new chromatography, some uh, unusual fragmentation, 
you can still use the mass spec domain to calculate the molecular formula. And you can actually approach the fragmentation pattern sort of from a chemical point of view, from a chemist's perspective. And you can look at both the fragment ions that are detected and associate each of those with molecular formula, but also the neutral losses. And you can measure things like the loss of a carbon dioxide, which tells you that there was a carboxylic acid group in the molecule. Things like that can build up structures. You can also do similarity searching, where you compare your unknown molecule to databases and see which features are similar. And you might perhaps uh, stumble across that you have a glycosylated version of some natural product that's already known, or you have a stereoisomer of some compound that's already known. When it comes to standards free identification, this is still in its infancy, but generally they're using machine learning and quantum chemistry to build up synthetic databases, which include everything from retention time, uh, fragmentation, even collision cross sections, which we won't talk about. And we can build a database and then compare that to our real world sample. This has a huge potential, but as I said, it's still a relatively young technique and it's something that PNNL is actively investing in. Moving on from identification, one other step that's really important is trying to minimize the amount of redundant information we have in our data set. So in your LCMS data set, you may contain thousands of peaks, thousands of features, but they're not actually all uniquely inf informative. And two main things we do to reduce the amount of redundant information is de-isotoping and de-adducting. So de-isotoping, essentially, um, what we're trying to do is remove features which are isotopologues, i.e. it's the same chemical structure, but there's a different isotopic composition. So in the case of glucose, you might replace one carbon-12 with one carbon-13. They'll have almost identical chemical properties, so they'll have the same retention time. They'll ionize with essentially the same efficiency, so they're pretty easy to pull out. We just look at a single scan at a single fixed retention time and look for anything that's separated by known isotopic differences, i.e. the mass difference between a carbon-12 and a carbon-13 is 1.003355. We can pull out any features that are separated exactly by that mass when we have a high resolution mass analyzer. And with that, we can pull out and get rid of these uh, redundant information. Deadducting is essentially the same thing, but looking at different uh, ion types or different uh, ionization forms of the same molecule. So we might ionize a molecule as a protonated form, a sodiated form, and a potassiated form, but we don't get any more information from the three of those than we did from one necessarily. So again, we just look at the mass difference between these different adduct types, and we can pull out those features and remove them. Alignment is a uh, common process we have to go through uh, in two cases, one of which is when you want to tabulate all of your unknown features and you only have retention time and mass to charge ratio as your unique identifiers. At that point, you want to make sure that your retention times for the same feature are actually the same retention times. And so we might shift things around to, to make them correct. Um, and also at the end of the day, uh, any unidentified features or in your overall table, you might want to normalize or correct your retention times. And so graphically, your three chromatographic traces might look something like this, where you have the same three features, but they're alluding at slightly different times for various reasons. And what you want is a single unified uh, retention time and mass to charge ratio. The other thing that is important to think about, and I don't wanna get hung up on it, is missing features. Um, really bring this home just because you don't see it it doesn't mean it isn't present and this is because of limits of detection ionization suppression feature overlap and so really try and avoid setting a missing value to zero um, and there are some ways that you can actually set a correct number instead of zero this is called imputation but you have to be really careful when you do this that you don't skew your results uh, but missing features are something that you need to pay attention to uh, when you're doing your analysis so briefly discussing some of the GCMS concepts, a lot of them are very similar to LCMS. It's the same overall idea of peak picking, deconvolution, alignment, and interpretation. But a couple of main differences include the ionization source is different. So we no longer have this MS1, MS2 distinction. We just get fragmentation ion spectra. And typically our mass analyzer is much lower resolution, but usually that's okay because we're looking at smaller molecules. Um, and a big advantage is GCMS is actually much cheaper as an instrument. A lot more labs have it. It tends to be more reproducible for various reasons. And so there's a lot more databases that you can actually compare to. In GCMS, we have um, 
two main steps uh, that are slightly different. And I've actually got these in the wrong order. Uh, so alignment is uh, converting our retention time to a retention time index. And here we're essentially calibrating our retention time against internal or external standards. So alkanes or fatty acid methyl esters would be injected and they will loot off of the column at sort of known reproducible times. And then we can normalize the measured retention time of our real samples real compounds to those measured things. This allows you to get much more consistent um, retention indexes than you would get from retention time alone. When it comes to identification, again, we do this with standards and databases. Um, we just tend to look up the fragmentation pattern, do similarity searches, and try and find the right uh, um, matches. As I said, it's a relatively accessible technique, so we have a lot of databases available. A couple more things about MSMS. Um, one really popular technique is molecular networking. So GNPS uh, from UCSD. Well, they've built databases where they fragment all of these different natural products. And then what they're looking at is the application of graph theory or networks to relate different fragmentations between different or the same fragmentation between different molecules to really build up an understanding of what motifs in our structures we can pull out from different commonly occurring fragment ions. And so this is really useful for identifying unknown species or for doing dereplication of complex natural products. When it comes to databases, uh, Metlin from Scripps is enormous. It's got about a million standards and they're all experimental data. Uh, and it supports a lot of similarity searching methods. Uh, GNPS uh, from UCSD, again, has public data sets available, big databases, and you can do some really cool stuff on their online software. And then there's HMDB. Uh, there's a few other spin-offs from the HMDB that cover other types of metabolomes. There's a bovine database, for example. NIST has a big database, and GALM is really useful for GCMS. And just Google, there's, there's so many out there. When it comes to software tools, again, there's a plethora of possible tools to use. Uh, in terms of free and open source tools, there's tons. Uh, XCMS is an R-based tool, and it does the whole pipeline, essentially. It's really powerful. But there's also ones with graphic interfaces like MS Dial or MZ Mine. Proteo Wizard is really popular for file conversions. Skyline, I think you'll learn about this afternoon. Core MS is something we're building in house and it's going to support all mass spectrometry uh, when it is complete. And Metabolite Detector and AMDIS are really useful for GCMS pipe processing. All of the commercial vendors also have their own tools. So Thermo, Brooker, Agilent, Waters all sell packages for data analysis. Uh, there's also third-party packages from Mestra Labs or ACD Labs for doing data analysis. And things I don't have time to talk about, but you must not neglect, uh, reproducibility. These instruments are contact, which means that your samples are touching it. Uh, the samples drift, sample performance changes, uh, instrument performance changes. So you need to run replicate measurements. You need to randomize the order in which you run your samples. But you also want to block your samples in a coherent, logical manner. So you don't just randomize the whole 400 samples. You might block them in groups and randomize within groups. You need to run quality control samples. If you don't have one, a really good place to start is pooling your sample set. Um, and again, unfortunately, you need to look at the data with your own set of eyes to really understand if it's good quality data. At the end of the day, if the instrument is producing bad data, there's nothing you can do with it. And you need to make sure you get the best possible data as early as possible. Um, normalization, I don't wanna go into, it's pretty complex and there's a lot of uh, philosophical debates to be had there. So in the time remaining, I will try and go over NMR, which uh, is actually more complicated than mass spec. So a lot of this is going to be sort of a sort of superficial introduction to it. Unfortunately, it takes a long time and a lot of expertise to really get to grips with how to process NMR data. In some ways, it's got a similar sort of divergence uh, as we saw with mass spec. On the left-hand side, after you've done your basic processing, you've got a targeted pipeline, also known as profiling or manual. And this is kind of what we're going to discuss this afternoon. This is really useful for small studies where you want to identify as many features as possible doing exploratory research. But it's really time intensive and it takes quite a bit of specialized skills. On the other side, there are untargeted or binning, bucketing, statistical approaches, wherein we can process many, many more samples. We could do most of it automated, uh, but we don't get identifications out of it. 
And so you actually end up using some bits of both pipelines to really do a whole study. Again, our data formats, uh, there's differences between the different vendors. Brooker are really the, the king of NMR these days. Uh, Varian and Agilent still have some instruments, but they don't sell anymore in JOL. Uh, they sell some instruments. We don't have any in EMSL, so most of our metabolomics is done on Brooker and Varian. And they have different proprietary file formats. But online, unlike in mass spec, they're actually sort of known formats. So there's a lot of open source software which can process these directly. Um, and in terms of these pipelines, there's a whole bunch of software. Some of it does bits and some of it does the whole pipeline. And there's commercial tools, again, from the vendors. So Brooker, Vary, and Jay all have their own tools. And then there's commercial third-party software from Mestre Lab, ACD Labs, and Konomics, which we're going to talk about this afternoon. As well, there's a number of free and open source tools. So NMR Pipe is hugely uh, powerful as a tool, although it's quite a steep learning curve. Something like MVA Pack is actually really nice for doing this second pipeline. If you want to get hands on with NMR data and NMR software, I recommend you check out NMR Box. It's NIH funded. It gives you access to an online virtual machine for free that contains a whole bunch of different NMR software tools. They have tutorials, example data sets, and a really friendly uh, community who will help you try some of this stuff out. So uh, have, a, have a look at N uh, NMR Box. Um, they've got about three or 4,000 users so far. So they're pretty good. Check them out. OK, so for NMR data processing, unfortunately, you have to start with signal processing. Um, some of the theory of this is kind of complicated because it's uh, mathematics without avoiding the pun, it is complex maths. We have to think about Fourier transforms and complex numbers. And fortunately, or sorry, fortunately, you don't actually have to know how they work. What you do have to understand, though, is how to correctly apply any of these functions. If you don't apply them correctly, you'll get incorrect quantification and incorrect statistical interpretation. So this is not a solved problem in routine automation, which is why you still have to be able to understand what's going on. As Robert mentioned this morning, uh, in NMR spectroscopy, we record a time domain signal. And this is the, uh, the precession of our bulk magnetization around a coil. And we detect this uh, exponentially decaying sinusoidal wave in the time domain. This is also known as a frequent free induction decay or transient. We want to get something more useful from this. And so we apply a Fourier transform. And this converts it from the time domain to the frequency domain. And again, as Robert mentioned this morning, we normalize all of our uh, spectra to uh, PPM so that all of our spectra, regardless of what magnetic field you used, what instrument you use, have the same x axis. These are still in hertz. They're just no longer at 800 megahertz, but instead maybe covers 10,000 hertz. The output of the FFT, unfortunately, doesn't look perfect. And we need to do a couple of things known as phasing and baseline correction. So this phasing originates from the, the output of an, a Fourier transform being a complex number. So the original spectrum in this case actually looked like this, where we've got a number of positive and negative signals. And this is obviously not ideal. And so instead, what we want to do is get purely positive signals uh, or absorptive line shapes. And we can press a button in the software and it'll automatically phase it. And we get something that looks like this, which is pretty good. But in reality, it's not perfect. Because if we do a, a vertical expansion on it, you can see that there are asymmetries to these features. There's distortion in this baseline. And it's not purely positive signals. There are some features here which are actually below 0. And so in that case, unfortunately, we need to do a manual phase correction. And this is why NMR processing becomes a bit more of a pain. So a, a small phase correction manually gets you this much nicer looking spectrum where your baseline is all above zero or at zero, and all of your lines are symmetrical. You can see these little features here are nice and symmetrical around the main feature. We then need to do a baseline correction. And essentially, this is to remove all of the systematic distortion in our noise that offsets it from zero. This is crucial if you want to get accurate quantification. So we can press a button in our software, and it will propose a solution to the problem. And we can apply it. And now we get something that looks like this. So this is a pretty idealized case where we have a nice flat baseline. Our signals are nicely phased. And the data looks really good. At this point, our uh, profiling approach or bidding approach diverge. 
So when we do profiling or targeted, unfortunately, this is slower. We need standards, we need databases, but it's the only way to get you know, identified chemicals and their quantification. One thing that we have to do is referencing. So this is a little bit like aligning in GCMS, except we just do a single point and we do a linear shift. So for various reasons like pH, temperature, and concentration, our chemical shifts or our x-axis positions will, will move left and right in our sample. So we reference to an internal standard, in this case, DSS, which in this case was slightly off from zero. And so we set it to be exactly zero ppm. And we also probably do this for the binning approach too. After this, we need to identify our compounds. Now this is hard and it requires uh, quite a lot of experience and skill. Fundamentally though, there's three things that we use. We use chemical shift, which is the x-axis position, which indicates something about the chemical environment of that nucleide. We use J-coupling, which is also known as the multiplicity, and that describes the peak pattern. So if we have a single sharp feature, or if we have two equally intense peaks, a doublet, or if we have three peaks in the case of a triplet, that tells us something about nearby or adjacent nuclei in that molecule. And then finally, signal integrals, so quantification. So the amount of signal that we detect for a feature directly tells us about how many uh, nuclei are giving rise to that signal. The simplest way of doing this, though, is by using something like Kinomics and doing what's called pattern matching. And so in this case, we just take databases of existing spectra and we try and match them up and minimize differences between our database spectra and our spectra that we've acquired. Unfortunately, a number of things within our samples and in our experiment can cause deviations in our measurement from the database. And these can include pH, concentration, the solvent that we're using, the temperature of the sample, and the magnetic field can all shift things around slightly. And so um, this is actually technically not correct. Magnetic field doesn't affect chemical shift. That's why we normalize PPM. But these factors are hard to control for comprehensively, uh, especially pH, where even 0.1 pH units can have a substantial impact on chemical shift. That said, when we do pattern matching and our database matches pretty well, this is what it looks like in practice. So this afternoon, we'll go into a bit more detail. But basically, in green, we have our recorded spectrum. We have a nice sharp signal here for DSS. And in purple is a library signal for DSS. And unfitted, you can see that it's, it's completely wrong. It's the wrong intensity. But we can get it to match almost perfectly with our measured spectrum. And now in green, we just have the residual signal. So this is a really nice match. Unfortunately, it is laborious, subjective, and manual. Uh, when it gets to more complex features, we have things like um, this set of signals here, which at first glance, you wouldn't necessarily know what that corresponds to. But we can determine with some experience and trial and error that there, there's four features in here corresponding to proline, and we can fit those signals here. And that leaves us a residual four features here, which actually correspond to cysteine. And so we can go and uh, put cysteine in there. And you see what happens when we had two uh, different signals that are so close, they're not resolved. They add together and we get this much larger single unresolved feature that's the sum of both of those. And so in NMR, because we're often resolution limited, we have routinely got overlapping signals. And that's what also makes this quite challenging to do. And you can see that even these fits are not perfect. There's quite a lot of residual signal and there's imperfections that are not possible to be resolved. Some signals get even more complex, like isoleucine here has a nice complicated set of peaks at 1.25 ppm. And it gets even worse than that, where we have multiple complex features for multiple different metabolites, all superimposed on top of each other. And so in this case, I can't even tell you what these metabolites were. And the fit job I did here is not ideal. You can see these features look pretty good because the red is matching the black pretty nicely. But over here, there's a big discrepancy between those. And so this is where it gets really subjective. Um, and one thing that's really important to note is the subjectivity means we need to do this essentially with one analyst doing all of the samples to make sure they do it cohesively. When it gets to more complex things where we want to identify unknown compounds that weren't in our database, when we want to identify features from unresolved or complex spectra, or when we want to do positive confirmation, 
one thing we might do is looking at more complex NMR experiments. Robert mentioned some of those these morning. So I just want to say um, very briefly, in addition to looking at proton NMR or hydrogen NMR, as we've seen already, you can also look at carbon NMR. So this is a carbon-13 spectrum for the same compound. You see it provides complementary information. We've also got these multidimensional experiments. So a 2D experiment, which shows you the correlation between adjacent hydrogens is called a COSY, and it looks something like this. And a 2D experiment, which shows you correlations between hydrogens and their directly bonded carbons is an HSQC experiment. And that gives you a spectrum that looks something like this. So these are super useful experiments at really getting structural information. And this is why NMR is able to give you full structural elucidation where LCMS is not necessarily. The output of something then is going to look something like this, where we've got our identified compounds, um, you know, a name to a chemical, and the amount of that that we've detected in concentration. The key thing to note is that only features we've identified will be tabulated. So if there's unidentified features, if there's signal area in our spectra that aren't included, aren't identified, those won't be tabulated. And so we might miss important information just because it's not in our database. So at that point, we want to use binning or bucketing approaches. Um, these can be done more automated. They can be done essentially without knowing anything about NMR. But if you want to I actually get a, a label and identification, you still need to go through some of these concepts. As I said, MVAPAC is a really nice tool. It's based in Octave, which is a bit like MATLAB. And they have published a few papers on it, which also demonstrate nicely the pipelines that you would go through. So again, you load the data, you do some signal processing, you reference the spectra, and then you bin it or you align it. Now, aligning is slightly different to uh, referencing. Um, and then, and I'll discuss it in a second. But you've also then got these downstream statistical models. So alignment is trying to compensate for these subtle differences in chemical shift between samples. So in this case, this example uses IcoShift algorithm and manages to correct these raw data and actually compensate and get them all nicely aligned like this. Now this technique works really nicely most of the time. And then when we do binning, what we're talking about is essentially downsampling our, our data set, which might have 100,000 or 200,000 data points in each spectrum, and binning it or bucketing it into these discrete uh, areas. And this is the other reason we want to do alignment. We want our, each of our bins and buckets to contain signals that are the same signal across spectra. And so we can go through the whole spectrum and bin it as such. And the output might look something like this, depending on what bin width you use. And so you can see that in this case, there's sort of a lot of features are lost once you get up to this bin width. So the wider the bin width, the more feature you lose. And when you get really wide bins, you end up distorting relative intensities and relative positions. So there are some trial and error associated with this. The output of all of this is then fed into a statistical model, either what would, will be discussed tomorrow or in terms of spectrum analysis. So you want to identify what features are key in your spectra, i.e. which are the most significant differences between sample types, or you want to identify which features are highly correlated within your spectra, i.e. identifying compounds or even identifying co-products of metabolic pathways. So in this case, uh, published a few years ago, we used principal component analysis to tell the difference between two types of Scotch whiskey, uh, blend whiskey and malt whiskey. And we could use PCA and look at the loadings to determine which features in the spectra were primarily responsible for this separation. Um, so this was a really nice technique and a nice demonstration for that. We can also identify which features are highly correlated. So we can do what's called a statistical toxy or S to O toxy. This essentially relies on the fact that all signals in NMR are proportional to concentration. And across 100 samples that are all similar, the features from the same compound will rise and, and fall proportional to the amount of that compound in solution. And so we can correlate our features across our sample set. And then features which are highly correlated, as is identified here in black, are actually signals from the same molecule. And features which are moderately correlated, so in this purple color, are features which come from the same biological pathway, the same metabolic pathway, and they have a sort of correlation through, through that. The other reason we do this is to identify which features are important. And so once you've um, done your statistical analysis and determined that this peak is something I need to identify, you can actually focus your resources and time better 
on just the most important features in your spectra. And so this is why this and the other pipeline tie together nicely. If you don't decide to do that, you can actually just export this data table, which will have you know, all of your samples as rows and then your different chemical shift bins as integral values. One thing to highlight is that if your uh, phasing in baseline is imperfect, you can actually end up with negative values. And so uh, here you could have a value of zero, but in reality, there's always noise. Um, and there's hybrid approaches which use a mixture of this and profiling to try and get all of the data out of the uh, spectrum. So pretty much on time, uh, I had a longer conclusion slide and then I decided it wasn't worth it. What I really wanna emphasize is that you need to design your experiment and it needs to encompass the whole thing. So everything from how you go about generating your data from your biological experiment, your sample preparation, your instrument use, through to actually looking at the data, doing a quality assessment on if it's good, identifying the features that you need to identify and how you will do that, and then what databases you're using and how you manage those. And all of this feeds through in a sort of circuitous path where there's a lot of feedback and feed forward at each stage. And with that, I'll end. And I'm sure there's questions if people have. Um, thank you. Yuri, are there any questions? It looks like um, there was a lot going on. There, there is one question there. Okay. Uh, one is, are there any MS2 values for FTICRLs? Uh, so yes and no. Um, FTICR, just like any other mass spectrometer, can be used uh, to fragment ions, and so you can get these fragmentation patterns. But on commercial FTICR instruments, doing uh, LCMS for metabolomics is actually relatively uncommon for a bunch of technical reasons. And so usually people use FTICR in very targeted approaches where you're isolating specific compounds and fragmenting just those or you do what's called this flow injection analysis where you don't do an online separation and you just infuse the whole sample at once and get broadband MS1 measurement of all the ions. Okay. Last one, and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, can you use intensity to determine relative abundances of compounds within a sample, even though you can compare one compound to another? Uh, no. Yeah. Sorry. It's much, much to the, the caveat with that is um, no, there's no caveat with that. You, you basically can't do it. You can put in internal standards if you have isotopically labeled standards for compounds and quantify that way, but that's not the question you were asking. So, yeah, for absolute quantification, you cannot do that. You can do for yeah. comparative analysis only, but you have to yeah. be aware that the what you're measuring there is the difference of the ion population is not the sample concentration, right? Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's exactly it. The, the signal you get in a mass spectrometer is, and the data you get out is what was detected in the mass spectrometer. It is not what was in your sample. And so if something uh, is failing or getting stuck or not eluding or breaking down in your LC separation or in the upfront ionization part of the mass spec, you won't detect it in the mass analyzer or it's, its total intensity will be attenuated. So uh, yeah, just remember what you're seeing is the signal detected and it's not the sample that you infused directly. Okay, so, all right, thank you. We'll, uh, over time, so we have some announce announcements and uh, Young Mo is gonna close the session for us, thank you. Well, thank you for the attendees and the panelists and the presenters today. And for right now, the, this the morning session is for the public, and then the afternoon break breakout group sessions for the only for the students. We selected for about twenty five students in the afternoon. And for those who will attend the afternoon session, please revisit our share folder and the resource document information. There is some update on that. And then we hope to see you back at the 1.15 at the given the link for the Zoom meeting. And otherwise, yes, all the presentation in the morning sessions are being recorded and they will be uploaded in our MC Summer School website. But unfortunately, we we have not record, recorded uh, the tutorial session in the afternoon. 
Okay, thank you everyone and hope to see you tomorrow morning. Uh, Becky, do you have any things to announce? Just to say that we'll start at 8.30 tomorrow and we look